I go down a number of rabbit holes throughout the week as I'm researching for a sermon, and I thought, uh, I, I'm just going to acknowledge one rabbit, rabbit hole briefly, and then I'm going to tell you why we're not going down it. Because we're going to talk about Abraham, and Abraham is given the promise of the land into eternity. And there's an issue around translation, because the word into eternity in Hebrew is ha-olam, and it means to the age, to the end of the age. And so, what's the end of the age? Right? And so, how the question becomes, if we're talking about ancient Israel and the promise that the Jewish people will have the land of ancient Israel, does that still apply today? Is modern Israel the same as ancient Israel? And I'm just going to say that that's a complicated question. You're comparing a modern democracy to an ancient theocracy, that like, and to compare the two, that, that gets hard. And so here's the rabbit hole I went down, and you're welcome, to, I'll show you how I did it if you want. But I started looking into um, modern Jewish opinions on the state of Israel. And there are some Jews who see the two as the same, ancient and modern Israel. There are some who see them as different, but they're thankful that modern Israel exists. There is also a very a large minority of Jews who see the creation of Israel as a sin, because it took the land away from the Palestinians who are living there, and then see the violence that has happened as the result of that sin. And so, uh, can we just say that modern Israel is a complicated question, and I'm not anywhere near smart enough to have an opinion about it today. And if you want to talk about it, let's drink some coffee, but let's just rabbit hole. Another Sunday. <laughs> so, you learn things about yourself when you go traveling. You ever notice this? You go traveling, and there are things you learn that you would never have learned if you stood still where, where you were. When Olivia and I went to uh, Italy, Olivia had studied Italian all four years in college. She had been raised around a bunch of Italians, Bavir Italians, right? A bunch of them. Olivia's one of them. And, and so she'd been around people speaking Italian all of her life. And, and so then we step off the plane, and we step to the curb, and in back of us is the airport and in front of us is Italy and here comes this moment because we've agreed like we're gonna be able we're gonna do this just the two of us we're not gonna do the like here join a group of 20 people we're gonna do this solo because Olivia knows Italian right and, and y'all if you've ever traveled overseas and you've studied the language it's one thing to say I know the language and then you get up there and you have to hail a cab for the first time and there's one thing to know Italian, and it's another thing to know Italian with someone who is Italian. And thanks be to God, it turns out that Olivia did really know Italian, because if not, oh man, that would have been awkward. <laughs> it would have been, this, we went before smartphones, like our ability to get to the hotel was based upon, can Olivia speak Italian? So she, she knows Italian. We know that in a way that you cannot know until you actually go. And then the great realization I had when traveling in Italy was that I can walk through, uh, I can be surrounded by people who I don't understand in a city that I don't know, eating things like you'd, I'd order, and I wasn't quite sure what I was getting, but I was sure there'd be some noodles involved and it was good enough for me. Uh, except for one dish. I didn't finish one dish when I was over there. If you ever see pasta and negro in the same sentence, don't get that. The negro is squid ink. And so it comes out and it's black and it just tastes horrifying. It's uh, <laughs> But I can do all of that if I had one thing a day. Here was the one thing I had to have every day for my own sanity. I had to have a Coke. I just needed to have five minutes to sit down and drink a can of Coke. Right? Because you know how you say Coke in Italian? Coke. It, and I don't even drink Coke when I'm here. Like, I drink tea all year long, all day long, all the time. But for some reason, that was what I needed to have to keep on being in a foreign country. I needed some Coke. That, that we, so we learn surprising things about ourselves. It, if you think about, like, the first time you drove in city traffic, 
right? It's, what do you learn about that? What, <laughs> that's a fun moment. Or, or the first time you pack up to go. Like, there's this moment when I packed up to go east. I'd finished up at Truman. I've moved out of my parents' house. I have a Ford Ranger and six plastic tubs of everything I have in the back of the truck. And that's it. Like, I'm done in the mid Midwest. Time to start the truck and go. Where am I going? I'm going east. I know where I'm landing, but I have no clue like how it's going to work out. Like there's, there's these, you realize things about yourself. Can I do this? Yeah, yeah, you can. Right? You realize things, you learn things traveling that you will never know unless you go and you do it. And so I want you to remember this, this, these moments of learning as we follow. We're going to follow Abram and Sarai as they take this journey today. They take the journey of a lifetime. Literally, it takes their life to make this journey. And, and so what God says to Abram is, go, right? Go from your country, and kind of rubs it in how much you're leaving. Go from your country, and your kindred, and your father's house. All that stuff you're comfortable with, go, right? Go west, and, and go to the land that I will show you. Why do you do this? He's, God tells him, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So Abram went, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed. He took his wife and his brother's son, excuse me, Lot, and all the possessions they had gathered, and they set forth to the land of Canaan. And so, if you think about it, what would they have to learn along the way? Like, if I told you right now, move to the West Coast, like, what would you have to learn between here and getting to California? Right? You'd have to learn a lot, especially if, if you're working the land. Remember, dude has a flock. So he can't move fast. He's got to keep track of what can the flock eat as they travel. Right? He's got to keep track of language. Right? What languages what does he need to know as he goes? And, and how is he going to get land when he gets there? You can't call a... If you were moving to California, you call a real estate agent. They find you a house. You go. Can't do that. And... 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And he's doing all of this at the age of 75. Now, ages in Genesis I take with a grain of salt. Like, I'm not... Was he 75 or was he like more... I don't know, like, because he ends up li living to like 110. I don't know. He wasn't 20. Like, that is very clear. This is not a young man sort of taking a journey to seek his fortune. This is an established fellow who has a family and he is packing up his household and leaving with all of that. And, and so off they go. Because the promises, if you will be a great nation, I'm giving you this land, the promise that you, it will be worth your time. And so they go. And you remember, as I said last time, that the space between verses can be sometimes very long. The space between 12.9, when Abraham packs up all of his goods, and then 12.10, when he arrives, the space between those two verses is about 500 miles. Like, it, we read through and it says, and then he left. Next verse, and then he, then he showed up. 500 miles later, on foot, with a flock and family, he shows up. That's a very long white space, isn't it? And so he shows up, and he starts learning this new area. As he shows up, famine sets in. And so and what will be the first of many times this happens, the, a, a, Abraham's descendants will do this as well. Abram goes to Egypt because Egypt has the Nile. Egypt always has plenty of food. And so he goes to Egypt, and as they're getting into Egypt, he looks at his wife and says, if anyone asks, you're my sister. Mm -hmm. Now, if it sounds like this is a setup for a horrible, horrible movie, like that, that's what this is. It is and she could have technically been his half-sister, but really, come on, folks, right? S wife. And so they get into Egypt, and, and Pharaoh sees her, and, and good-looking woman, and, and she has been, the, Abram and, and Sarai have brought with him a large flock. He's a man of substance. And so uh, he, he weds her. He marries her. And, and so the, it says that Pharaoh figures out what's happening. The... 
Jewish legends around this are that the way he figured out is that every time he tried to go to bed with her, he, he couldn't. He, he could not perform, if you can follow the drift there. And uh, he eventually he figured out there's something going on with this woman. And so he goes back and asks Abram, and yeah, you got me wife. And, and at this point, Pharaoh has given Abram a dowry, right? He has given Abram the, 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 the bride price to marry her. And so Abram gets all the more uh, cattle, more sheep, whatever he was given, for, because he was giving Pharaoh his sister. And, and Pharaoh says, take it, just, just get out of here before I get in trouble with God, just, and leave. And, and so he, he takes his, his sister and, and he leaves. You would hope that Abram would learn his lesson about this. He doesn't. He does it again. And then his son Isaac does it down the road in Genesis 20. So they, they don't learn this lesson. You'd hope they would. Abram then goes and he has to save his brother Lot from being captured. And uh, him and his, brother, and his uh, nephew Lot, they go their separate ways. And in the process, uh, Abram meets King Melchizedek. Which, uh, and the king Melchizedek says, well, you want to say thank you to God for this? And, and Abram says, yes, that's a great idea. Let me give you a tenth of what I have from this. And uh, Melchizedek means uh, righteous king. And so, like, if the righteous king shows up and says, do you want to do the right thing? That's kind of like your mom asking you, do you want to unload the dishwasher? Mom, yeah, I do, now that you asked me about it. Right? So Melchizedek shows up and says, do you want to do the right thing, king of righteousness? Yeah, okay. And so he gives this 10% to say thank you. And then chapter 15, the story keeps on traveling, the story keeps on unfolding. And God tells Abram, you are going to be the father of many nations, as many people as there are stars in the sky. And Abraham believed this, and it was it, Abraham and God were right with each other. And as a sign that this was going to happen, God tells Abram, take yourself a cow, a sheep, a goat, and two birds, cut them each in half, and lay them apart and wait. And that's what Abram does. And if you remember, like, this is how uh, covenants are cut, right? This relationship between God and Abram the, the, is a covenant that is cut. And one way you would mark this is you would cut animals in half and you would pass between the animals and you'd say, so shall I be cut in half if, this, if I don't hold up my end of this. And, and so Abram watches this because he knows what he has set up, the way to commit to this relationship. And a deep darkness falls, and it tells us that a fire and smoke came through between the two, uh, the halves of the animals. This fiery pot is the exact word. And again, uh, this is the first th time of many times something like this will happen. If you fast forward and, and you think of what will the Hebrew people follow out of Egypt? They, what do they fo follow by day? It's a pillar of smoke. And then at night they follow a pillar of fire. So, so fire and smoke is a sign that, that God's involved in this. And so God has passed through the two halves of these animals and committed to uh, being part of this covenant. And Abraham believed believes that of God's commitment and, and we keep on moving along and, and that's when we get to Genesis 17 where we read today and, and it's interesting because like God calls Abram when he's 75 years old ish and then by when we get to Genesis 17 Abram is a hundred and so it's like God's checking in with him every once in a while like at 75 he says go take this trip and then in Genesis 15 it's it's she's checking in with Abram when Abram's let's say 85 and saying I'm still good like we're still in this together here we go and then Genesis 17 is when Abram is a hundred or older whatever the number actually is and God shows up to Abram, and he says to him, Walk before me faithfully, and be blameless. How we read scripture matters. Like, where do we put the emphasis? Because there are always options. And we can read that as, Walk before me, and you better get it right. Right? Walk before me, and you better be blameless. This is sort of, is that what God's saying? Walk before me, or else. I mean, that type of tone. 
Well, that doesn't, that's not in keeping with what we've read thus far. Right? You're reading in context here. God says, walk before me and be blameless. It's sort of a cause and effect. Right? You are walking before me as you have been walking for the last couple decades. Walk, continue to walk before me and know that you are blameless. Right? You've made mistakes along the way. But don't worry about that. You are walking before me, and as a result of that, be blameless. Don't beat yourself up. Let's just keep on going. This is like a divine pep talk, right? Here we are. You're walking before me. You're doing great, boy. You're doing great. And God tells Abram, you will be the father of many nations. And he says, let's get your name lined up with that. And so he takes, he says, no longer are you Abram, which means exalted father. He, and he says, your name shall now be Abraham, father of many. Right, that's what Abraham means. And he says, Sarai, Sarai is going to now become Sarah, which means princess. When Abraham shows up to tell his wife that my name is now Abraham, and your name, uh, and she's got to be a little bit confused, but then he says, and your name, you're, you're princess now. Do you think he got much of an argument out of that? Like, you, you are now the princess of this family, right? Okay, <laughs> if you insist. <laughs> the princess says take the trash out. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that would have been an easy sell. But this idea of changing their names, Martin Buber, a, a Jewish theologian, notes that both Abraham and Sarah get the same letter. They get an H. Right? And, and if you look at God's name, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, well, the way he reads it is God takes a piece of his name and gives it to them. Like, here's a part of my name so that you, you know I'm always with you. I'm, I'm with you on this. And the idea of receiving a new name, like if you think about the joy when you get married and you change your name or when someone is adopted and they change their name, like there's a real joy here. Like this is, this is a wonderful thing to receive this gift of a new name. And so as Abraham and Sarah, they're told again, you're going to have this land, and, and so will, you, will your descendants. They are told to continue to be fruitful and multiply. Remember that in Genesis, the first thing God says to humanity is, be fruitful and multiply. It's the first commandment, be fruitful and multiply. And so as God gives Abraham and Sarah this land and says, be fruitful and multiply, in this land I'm giving you and all of your descendants. And the sign of this covenant, this relationship between us is, you shall circumcise yourself and all of your children who come after. There is an interesting connection here that I have to point out, and I'm going to attempt to do this delicately. It is impossible to fulfill the command to be fruitful and multiply without seeing the mark of the covenant circumcision. Do you see the connection there? You can't reproduce without seeing the circumcision. Right? Do I, if there's any confusion about the connection there, ask me afterwards, please. You'll probably figure it out. The Bible is far earthier than us Midwesterners really like to admit at times. And so, circumcision, cut this covenant into your flesh so that you know every time that you act to be fruitful and multiply, that the land you are filling is a gift from God. And, and it's interesting to note that circumcision, this, uh, this accepting the mark of this relationship, it doesn't happen right away. Like, if you think about the timeline here, when Abram is back and 75 years old and God says to him, I'd like you to take a journey and go west, he doesn't follow it up with, and by the way, circumcise yourself. Because at that point, do you think he would have said yes? I don't think so. You want me to do what? Right? And, and then when God checks in with him like 20 years later in Genesis 15, and, and he says, "Is you know what? I'm still going to make you a great people. And, and at this point, 
Abraham, Abram has uh, saved his nephew Lot and, and has gone in, through the famine and come out on the other side. And he's, he's gone through a lot more experiences, but still God doesn't ask him for, for circumcision at that point. It is only after Abram has been, Abraham has been following God for almost 30 years that God says, Okay, do you trust me? Do you believe in this relationship? Do you believe in this covenant? Okay, now, circumcision. Like, it's still a hard ask, but after 30 years, it makes more sense, right? And in a sense, it is still a hard ask. Like, if you... <laughs> I read some, a lot of rabbit holes this week. I did some reading about modern takes on circumcision, and there are people today who will argue that circumcision is one of the most violent things we do against children in all the world. Circumcision is this horrible, horrible mutilation, violence against children. And, okay, that's your argument. From a Christian point of view, here's our argument. Our, our, for me, father, right? I'm a dad. God help the lad. Well, after a lifetime of following Jesus, for me to offer my son to be circumcised is to say that I, the God who I have trusted thus far in my life, I now trust this child to God in his life. Right? It, that's what circumcision is. I am trusting you, God, with this my most precious gift. It takes a while to work your way up to that. That's why it doesn't happen when Abraham's 75. Give it a few decades. Then let's talk about it, right? I think it is worth noting as we look at, as we wrap up looking at this covenant, how the covenants are getting more particular. Like the un, uh, uh, as they unfold, they're getting more specific. With Noah, the covenant of Noah was look at the rainbow. Receive this gift, right? Receive this gift and live. Look at the rainbow and know there'll never be a flood. Does, does that ask anyone of the people who received that gift? Does it really burden anyone? Look at the rainbow. That all, that, that's pretty simple, right? And so we get to Abraham. And now we're getting a little bit more specific, a little bit more particular. Receive this land. Receive the promised land that will be the place that your family will prosper for generation after generation after generation. Receive the promise that I, God, will take care of you and will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And as you are being fruitful and multiplying, receive the mark of circumcision as the sign that you are accepting this gift. Right? It's getting a little bit more specific, isn't it? And, and then we're going to come up on the Ten Commandments shortly, and we're going to get more specific. Each step along the way, as we progress towards Jesus, gets a little bit more particular. Receive this gift and live changes people more and more and more as they receive this gift. And I think that is what I want to leave us with today. Think of the most amazing gifts you have been given in your life. Right? Abraham and Sarah, as they travel, they were given the gift of land and of a future. Think that's what they learn, right? They learn that they can trust God and they can receive this gift. Think of the gifts you have received. Every amazing gift that we receive changes our lives in a permanent fashion, doesn't it? Right? When someone gives you their life in marriage, your life will never be the same again, will it? When you receive the gift of a child, your life will never be the same again. And in the same way, when we hear God say, walk before me and be blameless, that sure does sound a lot like what Jesus talks about with forgiveness, right? You are forgiven. The gift that we are each given is far, that marks us far more than circumcision ever could because we are all marked as forgiven people. And that is why every Sunday we say it again and again, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And it is my prayer that that gift marks me and marks all of us in such a way that we are always able to do exactly what God says. Walk before me and know that you are blameless. Accept the joy and the peace and the promise and the certainty. You are blameless, forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.